afternoon, everybody. My name is Jordan Crumroy, and I'm welcoming America's Southern Regional Manager. And on behalf of our organization, I want to welcome you to this welcoming interactive 2021 session titled Fostering a Sense of Belonging in Your Community. We, before we begin, we want to thank our sponsors, Walmart and Western Union, for their sponsorship of this interactive and for their ongoing support. I want to start by talking about our objectives for this session. Um, first of all, we're going to explore a really exciting tool that we've just launched called the Taste of Belonging Cookbook. We'll then spend some time hearing from two incredibly profound speakers that are not only featured in the cookbook, but doing amazing work. We'll hear presentations from them um, with the hopes that you all leave inspired, but also equipped with tools and your tool belt to really do this work in your communities. A few housekeeping items. If you have uh, questions as we go along, please enter them into the chat and our staff will try to respond to any technical questions that you have. Uh, after the presentations from the speakers, we'll spend time in conversation format with them where we'll really do our best to field many of your submitted questions. So feel free to put them in the chat as we go along. We invite you to engage on social media during this session as well. And you can use the hashtag interactive2021. So please share that you're attending the interactive and any content that those in your social networks might you. and Instagram. <clears throat> we are getting some feedback. So I ask that if you can, please go ahead and mute yourself. I'm sure we will have uh, a great time here together. So let's go ahead and dig in. So about a year ago, I was pondering our work in the South. And I grew up in North Carolina. I lived in Georgia for a decade and recently moved back to North Carolina. And when I was a kid and I was displeased with what was on the dinner table, my mother, who admittedly still hates cooking, would look at me and say, I cook so you don't die. So fast forward to college, I discovered that food could not only keep us alive, uh, but help us connect. I worked with Christmas tree farm workers who would come to ESL classes with something delicious that they brought to share. Um, later as a social worker, home visits were a common part of my job. And it seemed that as soon as I sat on somebody's couch, a plate of something would appear. So then I moved to a new state and the best way that I knew to make friends was to say, hey, do you wanna come over to our house for dinner? Food connects us. Food invites us to experience another. Um, those Christmas tree farmers weren't bringing empanadas to ESL class because they thought I was hungry. They were bringing it as a way to say thank you, to show me who they were, to share something sacred from their culture, their family, to set the table for us to work together. All this to say, sometimes eating isn't about being hungry. Sometimes it's about sharing ourselves, about sharing something in common. So when I was brainstorming, you know, what tool do we need to help people build connections, to help us experience the other? My mind kept coming back to food. And I don't think it was my stomach. Um, judging by the turnout for this session, we're hungry. We're hungry for ways to go deeper and to build bridges with each other. So all this to say, this led us at Welcoming America to create a cookbook. So we created this cookbook as a tool for meaningful connection across differences. And you'll notice that it pairs recipes from diverse cultures with activities that connect people around a shared table and get them working together on a common goal. It also includes models on intergroup contact theory and promising community building examples. So take a look at the link here on the screen you can download a free copy for yourself and we highly encourage you to do so. You'll also notice here at the top, the hashtag for the cookbook, which is Taste of Belonging. So there are a million different creative ways to bring people together. Today, we're gonna hear from two incredible folks firsthand. And these people have been running um, very distinct 
very different creative programs aimed at decreasing prejudice between groups. Both of their models get people doing something together as a shared activity, and both, of course, are featured in the cookbook. Um, so let's go ahead and meet them. So joining us today, we have Chandra Denat wetstein who is the VP of Programs and Operations at the One America Movement, which is a national organization building a united American society by eliminating toxic polarization. Chandra develops systems, curriculums, and programs for religious leaders and congregations, implementing program interventions across religious, political, and racial divides, as well as leads the organization's program scaling and operational development. Our other speaker, Salome Mwangi, is a Refugee Speakers Bureau coordinator with the Idaho Office for Refugees. She was born and raised in Kenya, relocated to the United States via the Refugee Resettlement Program and is called Boise, Idaho home for the past 16 years. She enjoys collaborating with community members and using storytelling to build bridges through shared human experiences like cooking and eating together. She currently manages the Refugee Speakers Bureau at the Idaho Office for Refugees, supporting them and shaping their stories and sharing them with the community. And as I mentioned, I am Jordan Crumroy, and I'm delighted to be here in conversation with these two amazing leaders. We'll spend about 10 minutes each, about 20 minutes total, hearing from them a little bit more about the ins and outs of their programs. And after the presentations, we'll move to a conversation with both. So as a reminder, you can enter questions you have into the chat, and we'll do our best to gather those for the speakers to respond to during the panel discussion. So Chandra, we will start with you and I'll invite you to share now with us about what you all have been doing. So take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having the One America Movement and having me uh, here to share a little bit about what we do. Um, you know, when I first started working at One America, I didn't necessarily think about the food part of our model as being such a big, a big part of it. We work um, in a model where we have service projects, shared meals and conversations, bringing people together across mostly religious and political divides. And it really wasn't until I started talking with you, Jordan, about um, the cookbook, which thank you again for featuring us in that, um, that I really started thinking about how important the, the meal actually is to the whole thing. Um, so in the cookbook, we talk about the work that we did um, in a program in Atlanta, but the One America Movement actually spans across the country. We also have chapters in Houston, in Philadelphia, DC, West Virginia, Chicago, Utah, uh, Southern California, Charlottesville, Virginia, Michigan, and we're starting work uh, soon in Jackson, Mississippi, and Danville, Virginia also. So I wanted to share a little bit about the work that we have been doing in Houston over the past couple of years. We can advance the slide here. So as I am sure you all know, um, in August 2017, Hurricane Harvey hit the Houston area and that caused $125 billion worth of damage. And it took unfortunately 107 lives. And only two weeks later, Hurricane Maria made landfall on the island of Puerto Rico. That knocked out the power grid. It cut off people's water, homes were destroyed and people languished there for months without important services. And so not only was there so much infrastructure damaged, but it triggered waves of partisan bickering about relief and response and how these things should be allocated to different parts of our national community. And so it was in kind of this cultural milieu that an unlikely coalition was born in Houston. Can you advance the slide, Jordan? Thank you. So we brought together uh, two rabbis an African-American pastor, a Puerto Rican organizer, an evangelical minister, and an imam. 
uh, to do something, not only about the physical destruction of the buildings in their community, but also about the partisan polarization that they saw keeping their city from healing after this natural disaster. Next slide. So these folks got together and we supported them in having service, conversation, and learning events. They rebuilt homes uh, and renovated homes in Houston's Fifth Ward, which was one of the most hard hit areas and happened to be an underserved community in Houston. And during these projects, they would share a meal together and we would facilitate a conversation. They learned about each other's faiths, um, their faith journeys and communities, and also how they saw different policy issues differently across their religious and political divides. And we also brought in a neuroscientist to provide a bit of training on the trauma and how trauma affects uh, our divisions in the country. Because when we go through traumatic experiences, it can actually deepen those us versus them dynamics. So this group worked together for over a year, uh, rebuilding homes and learning about each other and deepening these relationships. And then they came together and they brought some of their congregants and they traveled to Puerto Rico. And that's on the next slide there. And they spent a week in Puerto Rico together. They stayed at Airbnbs, um, sharing meals, cooking together, living together. And during the day, they worked alongside a group from Cincinnati, Ohio and hosted by Hunger Corps in Puerto Rico to rebuild the home of a family that had narrowly escaped uh, Hurricane Maria. Uh, this family had taken refuge in a cave with many uh, other families from their neighborhood. And they stayed in that cave for weeks before uh, relief and assistance arrived. So our group worked together rebuilding this home Every evening they had facilitated conversations about what they were seeing and how that was affecting their faith journeys um, and how that was also affecting their uh, impressions and what they saw about our country and how we provided services in such a time as the need for disaster relief. So these folks still have relationships today. They still meet regularly and talk and, and meet over, over um, food in, back in Houston after they went home. So this might seem like it's just another heartwarming story, a few homes being rebuilt, isn't that nice? Um, but actually this is by design and it's by necessity. Uh, to rebuild our country's relationships, our society, and our communal infrastructure. Next slide, please. So I don't know if you all are aware of this, um, and maybe you won't be surprised, but our country has a polarization problem. Now, all countries, all societies have some level of polarization. Polarization just means we disagree about things. Um, and that can be good, it can be healthy, it can advance the conversation. But when our polarization stops being about our ideas and it starts being about our identities, well, then we are in trouble. This is the polarization that drives us further and further apart. We start seeing each other as being extreme caricatures of the other side. So collaboration becomes hard. And when collaboration is hard, those extreme voices are elevated. And so of course that makes our collaboration even harder. And we're driven into this negative feedback loop. That is what our friends in Houston were seeing and what they were actually fighting against. And the sad thing is that it isn't just our relationships breaking down, but it makes solving our common problems harder. Things like adequate health care, addressing homelessness, food insecurity, um, clean water, climate change, disaster relief, all of these things are made worse by our toxic polarization. 
but the neuroscience and social science can tell us how to address this. First of all, we need to expand our group. We need to mix it up. We don't have to agree with everyone to be able to work together. If we really want to heal our country, we have to create what social scientists call cross-cutting identities. It's on the next slide, please. Cross-cutting identities um, are those identities that bring us together when our core identity seems really far apart. This is what tells us that I may be a Democrat and you may be a Republican, but we both care about homelessness. Or I may be Muslim and you may be Christian, but we're both concerned about disaster relief. Cross-cutting identities create a banner that we can all rally under. And we really need that now more than ever. Next slide, please. And finally, you can't fake this. Putting people in an artificial dialogue doesn't work. Pretending that we're all the same and declaring some kind of false unity doesn't work. But it's the time that's spent together, the hard work, the caring about the same people, even though we might view the issues very, very differently. That's what's going to work. That's what really matters. How many meals were shared across tables in Houston and Puerto Rico? And how many conversations naturally flowed from those meals? There's really something sacred about breaking bread together, which is what I love about the Welcoming America cookbook and also about being here today. America does have a polarization problem and we aren't going to fix that by talking our way out of it, but we might fix it by building our way out of it. And we just might be able to eat our way out of it. And I am certain as sure as goodness that we can love our way out of it. And that is what our friends in Houston were doing all along. So if you'd like to know more about the One America movement or about the science behind our polarization, I'd invite you to check us out at our website, oneamericamovement.org. We have monthly virtual training. Some of the, the topics are featured here and we're always adding new curriculum. And we're also happy to, uh, to talk with you about how we can help in your community as well. So thank you again, Jordan, for having the One America Movement um, on this panel today. And I will kick it over to Salome. Thank you, Chandra. And thank you, Welcoming America, for inviting me to share um, some of the things that we have been doing here in Boise, Idaho. So Boise, Idaho is a welcoming community and um, I'm not planning to overwhelm you with the things that we have been doing. They really are not overwhelming, but we pivoted um, what we had originally planned to do, obviously because of COVID. Initially, we were going to have meals where people sat down together and shared uh, an ethnic meal. So it could have been an Ethiopian or an Iraqi or you know, whatever meal that was going to be different and bringing people together to the table. However, because of COVID, we had to rethink how we were still going to reach people, reach them with food, and yet continue fostering that sense of community. Next slide, please. So we call them the cross culinary kits and classes where you would cook dishes from around the world in the comfort of your kitchen. And what we did was uh, Idaho Office for Refugees partnered with a program that we have called Global Gardens. And this is where refugees within the community are given pieces of land where they grow their own produce. It can be produce that they will consume or produce that they can sell within the community in one of the Saturday markets. And so we partnered with them when, when the weather obviously is doing better then we're able to get produce from them and if not we actually looked for local um, 
local uh, grocery, not really a grocery, even the groceries, we'd look for the ones that are like a mom and pop or one that is that belongs to the community whose meal we are going to cook. Next slide, please. So when we started out in September, we thought, you know, let's keep it small, let's not be too ambitious. And we did the Lao egg rolls. And the moment we posted it on our website and on Facebook, the class, and we tried to keep it to about 40 people, it was sold out, I think in three hours. And we have been unable to keep up with the demand from within the community with people wanting to join the class. We are teaching it on Zoom. And we have decided to keep it to about 40 per class. And that way it's interactive enough and uh, intimate in enough to where we are able to show each other what are we cooking, where are you at, do you need us to slow down for you, um, is something not working out for you. And at the end of it, we actually showcase what we have made in our kitchens through Zoom. And that way we are able to realize, oh my goodness, even though everybody is in their own homes, we are sharing in this experience of, for example, making Lao egg rolls. Next slide, please. The next month we had uh, Shadi teach us how to make Syrian uh, kefta and a salad. And again, that class was sold out so quickly that we had to turn around and set up another class for Shadi about two weeks later, just because of the de demand within the community. Next slide, please. After that, I was honored to do a Kenyan class where I we made because I, you know, I was I was the facilitator, but everybody was cooking in their own kitchen. Were able to make chicken tikka, potato bajias, and kachumbari. And as we have done this, it's been so interesting to note that what we call kachumbari, for example, in the Kenyan culture, is actually pico de gallo from. Uh, the Mexican or the Spanish speaking population. And all of a sudden, this um, myth that you had or this um, mystery that was in your head all of a sudden comes to light and you realize, oh, I know this. Oh, this is familiar. And this is what, what we call it in my culture. Or this is where I experienced it when I had traveled to a different culture. Next slide, please. And then in December, we had the Venezuelan class. And uh, Leela was able to teach us again, because of the high demand, we had to hold two classes, one on December the 12th. And I think the other one was like on December the 23rd. It was a few days just before Christmas. And what happens is that as we are cooking, we are chatting, we are asking each other questions. A lot of questions uh, that obviously all the classes that we have taught are from people who have been outside the country, you know, who are from other countries and have come here. So it's about what has your journey been like? What have your experiences in this community been like? I mean, there's no denying Boise, Idaho is a very white, actually Idaho is a very white state and is notorious for um, the other side, being on the other side of the tracks when it comes to issues of inclusivity and diversity. However, these have uh, opened that up and we found people are so hungry. Like uh, Jordan said, it's not just a hunger of the stomach, it's a hunger to get to know each other, especially in this time when we have been so segregated because of the pandemic and everybody has had to stay at home. So to be able to get these meals put together. Now, what we've also done is that we put together kits and in the kit, we'll, we'll give you the things that may be difficult to find. We obviously have the, um, the vegetables and maybe there's like uh, one of the classes that we had, there was, I think it's called a salty wine that is used to make the beans. So then we'll provide you uh, with that salty wine. And so that kit costs $25. We try and keep it to about $25 and you'll find that, but it is really time consuming because you find it's, you can't just find the ingredients in one place. You're probably going to three different stores and then going back to the office and packing everything into 40 bags and then having to dedicate a day where everybody comes in and picks up their kits, but they are well worth the effort. Next slide, please. 
Then in January, we had one with uh, a Gambian friend and a chef for the month. And she was able to make this this uh, dish for, you know, we were able to cook with her and we made this rice dish. The thing that was really uh, interesting for me is realizing that once we come here, sometimes you don't have the ingredients that you would be using back home or the vegetable or the fruit. So how have we adapted and tried to make those same dishes that we would have back in our home countries, but using local ingredients? For example, her, her, the green dish that she made is actually um, some leaves that naturally occur. I think they're called sorrel. Not very common here, but in Gambia, they're very common. But then she also realized when she moved to the US that if you take spinach and you put a little bit of okra, it gives you the flavor and the texture of the sorrel. So we discuss those things as we are making these dishes. And um, so that was Gambia. Next slide, please. In February, we chose to celebrate the Chinese New Year by cooking a Chinese meal and uh, Oshi was able to take us through the steps and we make the food together, we taste it. This is what Oshi made. And at the end of each, at the end of, uh, each session, people are showcasing what they have made and we ooh and we are, ah, and we go, oh my goodness, how could you make so much in, in the same time? Next slide, please. And then in April, we realized we've got to take a break. We were moving at such a fast pace. Uh, the Chinese class, we were able to run it in three sessions. And by that time, we were pretty burnt out. And so we took a break in April and decided, okay, so how are we going to continue doing this? Do we have, um, are there options that we could use? Are there other options? You know, could we do it without providing the kits or is there value in providing the kits, you know, time consuming as it is? And as you can see here, we have George who joined us for one of the classes uh, when we're doing the Syrian cooking. And the reason why I like this picture is to show that you can still have people. We've been joined by people who are in states as far away as Texas who sign up pay the $25 and we send them a copy of the recipe and the Zoom link, and they're able to buy the ingredients themselves. Next slide, please. And then now we're back on track and we started out with a Cuban meal on, I believe it was May the 1st. And again, it was very interesting making this meal together, chatting with Noel, who was the chef of the day. And you know, we also, and not only do we talk about food, we also talk about has anybody ever been to one of those countries and what were their experiences and what did they bring back? And we've had people showcase like jewelry or other mementos that they bought or that they got while they were traveling in those other countries. So then you find that it breaks down all these barriers that we assume of, oh my goodness, we're, we're making something Syrian. This might be politicized. In fact, I have not found anybody politicizing any of these classes that we have had. It's almost as if we're able to lay down all these narratives that we have been hearing or that have been out there. And we sit down and we enjoy this meal, making the meals together and then eating them and talking about the experiences that we're having. And sometimes you'll find people are asking, I know that you're using ground beef. Could I use Beyond Beef? Could I use tofu? Could I use? And so it's it's been really interesting such that not only are we making the meals together, but we're also stretching uh, ourselves to accommodate alternative um, ingredients that people may have or would prefer to have. Next slide, please. So what Boise, Idaho has been trying to do is create, has been doing actually, not has been trying to do, we've been creating welcoming communities where we can all thrive together. So regardless of where you come from, whether you belong here or you've come from a different place, we are still able to thrive together. Next slide, please. So the other thing that we've also been doing is what uh, we ended up calling the Zoom tea or coffee lounge. And we started with the idea of uh, if you were invited for a Swedish fika, and this is kind of like a, a high tea or a high coffee, and you would have coffee with a snack, and since we're meeting on Zoom, everybody would show up with the coffee and the snack. And in the invitation, it would tell you, please show up with a snack. And the first time we did it, we talked about the snack and the significance and uh, why does it matter? What, what does it remind you of? And all of a sudden, uh, 
people who did not know each other, people from diverse places in the community, people who have lived in Idaho all their lives, people who've been to other places and as missionaries and then come back. And so sharing those connections and realizing that what we share in common is more than what we perceive to be the things that are dividing us, such that each, even before we could plan the one for the next month, you would find people asking, so when is the next time we're meeting? And can I bring my sister or can I bring, can I invite a brother? And initially when we started, we had two, one for the women who had kind of like started it off and had been going on very well. And then the other one was for the guys and the guys were actually able to order meals from ethnic restaurants and able to share them over Zoom and have discussions over this meal um, virtually. Next slide, please. And this is another one, another invitation. And uh, we try to stick to a theme, you know, um, uh, what's your favorite summer thing? Or what's your favorite summer memory? Or what's your favorite memory about your mother? The, the one thing that I remember really stood out for me is when there was there's this young lady who is a Muslim and she showed up and she actually showed up more than once. And I think we got to the point where people felt like we could be authentically curious. I could ask questions that I have always wanted to ask, but never felt like I could ask them. So this young woman was able to talk about how somebody had asked her, so when you take a shower, do you leave your hijab on and just take a shower? And then, and you know, rather than somebody looking down on it and saying, man, that is so stupid. I don't, she, she was able to say, no, actually, let me tell you. And we were able to talk about the hijab actually being more of a cultural covering than a religious covering. You know, if you look in the older books or in the Bible, you know, uh, you, you'll find out that even Mary, the mother of Jesus, used to cover her head. Not because no, it's, it's really not religious, it's more of the culture. And then unpacking that in a way where everybody who's sitting in that table is able to ask questions, is able to receive answers. And if they need to dig a little deeper, they can do that as well. And all of a sudden, all these uh, demarcations or all these labels that we have given ourselves that say Muslim or Christian or black or white, kind of like began to fade into the background as we realized that we were all women sharing in this experience of hungering for each other's company and each other's hand as we went together on this walk. Next slide, please. One of the other things that we have also tried to do over the years is um, kind of like inviting people to the table. Obviously now we're doing it on Zoom. And so in December, we held what we called a holiday stories from around the world, recognizing that it's not just Christmas that is celebrated. I mean, in, in America, you would think that everything starts, uh, you know, from Halloween and ends by December and that's the end of it. So bringing storytellers from who have come here from around the world and them talking about maybe you're a Buddhist and what is the greatest holiday celebration for you. Maybe you are a Muslim and so Ramadan. So we were able to talk about the holidays that resonate so deeply with us who have come from other places. And uh, so that's another way that we are actually building a bigger table in this community and, and inviting anybody who is interested to come and share in it. Next slide, please. And so none of these efforts would be possible without the sponsors that we have. Obviously, there is Welcoming America. And then we have the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, Idaho Office for Refugees, Global Gardens, the Refugee Speakers Bureau, and the Idaho Museum of International Diaspora. And I just want to leave you with this quote, which I have found to be so very true, that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together and we want to go far. Thank you, I'll hand it over back to Jordan. All right, thank you both uh, so, so much for sharing with us your incredible programs. Um, just looking at the chat, I think uh, I can speak for all of us when I say that this is truly inspiring. So I wanna spend a few moments now um, really transitioning us into a conversation. Um, I'll encourage folks to use the chat. We accidentally had it disabled for a few minutes there at the beginning, but it is working now. So we encourage you to chat in your questions for both of the speakers and also to engage with each other. Um, 
So what we're going to do is start with a few questions here. We're going to, hopefully you should be able to see each other here now. So I wanna start with a question for, for both of you, for Salome and Chandra about COVID. I mean, this year we have been pushed further and further into our homes, literally locked behind closed doors. And so how did participants respond? during this time? You know, I think that there was a hunger for people to connect after the isolation, whether it was the social distancing or, um, you know, whatever it was, not being able to go to work, kids staying at home. So there was this hunger for people to be able to connect. So when we started doing the, um, the Zoom tea coffee lounge, we were actually concerned that we wouldn't get enough people, but we were surprised. And by the end of uh, last year, we actually realized, hey, we may need to form a second group because the first group was growing too large. And we didn't want to lose that sense of intimacy. We didn't want it to be a group that was so large that people would not be able to attend and to ask questions and to participate. And so we, we would get about 12 to 15 people each time. And when it started going over that is when we thought, no, we, we want to keep the intimacy while uh, continuing with the work. Yeah, I think for us, you know, we were kind of dormant for a couple of months. I mean, it's hard to, to do service projects uh, virtually and especially working with faith communities that are, you know, they're mobilizing to try to address their own, you know, communities issues and how are we going to do worship and just, we were trying to support the faith leaders um, as much as we possibly could. So when we finally got people together, I think um, it was like early summer last year. And we just had events where we, you know, talked about how, how are you doing? Like genuinely gave people an opportunity, kind of like you were saying, Salome, to just be together. And I think, you know, on one hand, we were all in this together. And on the other hand, everyone felt like, well, my situation's unique. You know, I have kids at home or I'm isolated or I'm you know, stuck in this roommate situation, right? So everybody's got different things going on. So it can feel very isolating even while we're all in it together. And so just seeing people make that connection, like, oh, you're experiencing it this way. I am too, um, was really powerful to watch people make those connections even through the medium of the screen. And for us, that really jump started us to do a lot more events virtually. Um, and I feel like there was kind of this shared sense of grief around the whole thing. Yeah, that, you know, I think when I first was thinking about you all and COVID and like, how in the world does this, you know, do you do, you do this? Um, you know, the sad reality is I think so many of us were just desperate for human connection or just to talk to people that don't live in our house. And so it makes sense to me that the response to your programs would maybe even, you know, blossom uh, during this short of, sort of, as you said, Chandra, like the shared experience of shared grief is, is so real. So kind of along that lines, can you talk a little bit about how your uh, understanding of belonging, how your understanding of othering. Um, you know, we just heard from from Dr. John Powell, who, who speaks a lot to othering and belonging. How, how has your concept or understanding of that changed um, or evolved as you've gone about this work? So I remember that um, I think Ramadan last year was in May. And all of a sudden, they couldn't go to the mosque because everybody was isolating at home. They couldn't share the evening meal break when they were breaking the fast with other people. And I remember talking to one of the ladies who uh, works at the mosque and actually coordinates their outreach. And when people listened to that interview, so we recorded it and put it on Facebook. And there was this sense of, oh my goodness, I hadn't even contemplated 
how challenging it must be to be going through the holiest month of the year for you and you're doing it in isolation. And it just created a sense of um, empathy such that now we, I, I felt like, baby, I wanna hug you, right? And so when we continued doing the things that we were doing, there was already that sense because we, start, we started putting out those um, interviews that we recorded on Zoom into social media. And when we would meet like on the Zoom tea lounge, it was, I feel it. And it, I think it really humanized the experience that we were going through. And like I said earlier, we stopped being Muslims and black and white and whatever. We became human beings who are carrying this burden that was heavier than any one of us is equipped to bear. Absolutely. You know, I am. Um... I've been thinking about this question since you posed it to us the other day, Jordan, and I kind of have two responses. One is, you know, before coming to work at the One America Movement, I worked in international development and I traveled all over to very rural and remote places. Um, and one of my main projects was working on wheelchair provision. And we would mobilize people to identify folks who might need a wheelchair. And that was a very small percentage of the population. And yet we would mobilize all these people in a village or a community who would help us to identify who might need a chair. And one time I asked them, you know, like you're, you're young men, you're here uh, in Kenya, like in this village, why are you spending your time like walking around the countryside looking for people who might need a wheelchair? And they said, well, because we belong to each other. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, we are missing this. We are missing this in the United States. We don't have a, a sense of belonging to each other um, in the same way that, that I saw abroad. And so coming back to uh, the United States and, and working with the One America Movement, that's really what we're trying to do is create this sense that we might disagree on a whole bunch of stuff, uh, but we belong to one another and there's a responsibility in that. Um, when disasters strike like the pandemic or like um, the hurricanes that I spoke about earlier. And so um, the other kind of piece of that question for me is we're dealing in the United States right now with a lot of issues of misinformation. And one thing that I've learned through this work and through our, our engagement with the social scientists is that belonging is a key way to guard against conspiracy theory and misinformation. And so I just keep coming back to the importance of community and building that community and that kind of sense of shared identity as um, helping us to weave the fabric of our society. So Chandra, as you're, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking back to Salome, you were saying that in, in one of your sessions, uh, a participant spoke up and, and asked the question, you know, hey, do you shower with your hijab on? And I'm thinking about all of the possible responses that could have been said to that question. But I, I remember you also talking about authentic curiosity, I think is what you called it. So say more about that. Like where, what role does curiosity play? And Chandra, I know you, you talk a lot about and, and teach folks a lot about the neuroscience of polarization. I'm just curious, like, is curiosity maybe a tool that we haven't fully tapped into? Could it actually be something that could help inoculate and, and really prevent fear from, from rising up. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. You know, um, authentic curiosity is something that I've learned even when I'm relating with my daughter, for example, right? Who's a teenager. And I could either assume things about her and just say, you're grounded, you've lost your privileges because I've told myself a story, but I haven't, and I've, I'm learning to ask. So I'm curious to know what happened. I'm curious to know why. 
And I've realized that the moment my daughter realizes that I really do want to know, and I haven't made up my mind about who she is or what she did, she comes out and whatever she tells me blows me away. Because I'm thinking that my radar wasn't even there. And it's the same thing with members of our community who maybe I've, re I've, I've decided that women in a hijab are oppressed, are like this, are like that, and therefore, and yet if I ask them, tell me a little bit more about your hijab. Tell me a little bit more about your faith. And when people sense that that is authentic curiosity and that you're not asking a question to put them down, you will hear things that you've never heard about. I mean, I have heard stories where I'm thinking, help me pick my jaw off the floor because that is not the answer that I expected. That is not where I thought this was going. And we end up in a place that opens up my heart as well. And I'm able to come up and say, I am so sorry, because that is not what I thought. This is what I've heard. And even as we're working within our communities and we're talking about misinformation and disinformation, I think the secret sauce is in the listening. And listening means that I'm listening to you and I'm hearing what you're saying. And I'm also listening to what you're not saying. And then I can come back and ask, for example, the other day I was talking with somebody that I was getting to know and we've been talking and we've been chatting and both of us were very chatty. And then I just said, you know, I noticed that you don't mention your mother. And you know, the next hour we talked about her mom who passed away when she was a teenager and she feels very, and I tell you, she had tissues in her hand. I had tissues. I mean, we were like, time out. I need to get some more tissues because, and I just thought, what if I hadn't taken the time to hear what wasn't being said. And this can happen with anybody from any culture to where you can say, I'm not going to assume that you don't have a father. Tell me a little bit about your father. Tell me a little bit about your family relations. Many of us who are uh, from other countries and other cultures come from collectivist cultures. And in collectivist cultures, when my daughter gets an A, guess who gets an A? When my daughter fails, guess who fails? <laughs> and so when we come here and everybody's doing their own thing and my daughter is getting a C and thinking she can get, get away with it, I'm like, no. -uh -uh. And so being able to explain that to them and for people to realize, oh, it's because we live life together. It's because we cook together. I don't know how to cook one cup of rice. I, what do I do with one cup of rice? I'm used to cooking four cups of rice because there's always people who are going to show up. And so I'm not wasting food. I know that there's people who are going to show up and that we're going to share in this. And so opening people's eyes to realize, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way. I did not realize that there's people who come from third cultures. Uh, sorry, not from third culture. That, those are the kids from uh, collectivist cultures where we do things together. And we, we, don't, we don't know how to do the individualistic thing of, you know, driving up to Starbucks and ordering a cup of coffee just for myself. Really? At One America, our first events, when we, when we first get two groups together um, and we do a service and conversation event, they'll do the service project. And we always end the conversation event with what we call the index card exercise to try to get at exactly what you're talking about, Salome, trying to get people to express that authentic curiosity in a way that they feel is safe. So we pass out index cards, blank index cards, and give people the opportunity to write down any question for someone from, from the other group that they always wanted to ask, but they were embarrassed about, like the hijab question, which of course comes up. Um, and then we kind of uh, sort through those questions and bundle them um, and give people an opportunity to share their own experience in relation to that question. So not saying you're on the spot to tell me everything about your culture in relation to this question, but what's your experience that could speak to this, um, to this question. And I think we get some really interesting both questions and answers um, similar to what you were saying. And I think it's about coming without an agenda to change someone's mind, but just to really, really hear what they have to say and to deepen the relationship. Anytime we teach about, you know, how to have difficult conversations across a divide, I always say, 
look, you can't be going into this hoping to change somebody's mind. If that's what you're you're trying to do, then this, you know, this conversation guide is not for you because this is about deepening relationships and building relationships. And that is so hard to do, right? Like that's the that's the challenge is 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 training ourselves to be able to enter those conversations without that agenda that seems to kind of come natural to us. Um, Chandra, I'm I'm gonna ask you a question that you know uh, months ago, gosh, like in November, I think when we were putting together this cookbook and I called you many, many times with questions about, you know, hey, one question about your model, did you say? And, and one of the things I recall you talking about was you would ask folks to tell us, tell, tell the group about the story of your name. And I don't know if you remember this, this might've just been something that you, you know, it might've not been a, a huge part, but it really struck me um, the things that that question evokes. So would you tell us a little bit about how you use that in your groups and, and kind of how you've seen that play out? Sure. You know, um, we always start with some kind of icebreaker question. We generally get people, you know, as they're eating, we have them sit together um, in kind of mixed groups, usually small, you know, six to eight people at a table kind of thing. And we pose some kind of icebreaker question. Um, and that's one of the ones that I love the most would tell us the story of your name because you get such interesting and rich stories, people talking about their, their family ancestry or um, even just, you know, when, when the three of us met and we're talking about how do we pronounce our names um, that can be an interesting conversation as well and can lead to conversations about what is our, our background, our, our ethnicity, or why something, you know, came about the way that it did. Um, and it's so, so personal. Um, you can't really talk about your own name without talking about yourself, right? Um, and it's not about your opinions or your beliefs or your politics. Um, it's really just about you and the core of who you are. And so um, that's one of the icebreakers that I love the most. I, we also do one that is tell, uh, share one thing you do every day. And we'll go around the group three times. The first time is very um, kind of superficial. So like I brush my teeth every day. And then the next time we go around, we ask people to go a little bit deeper um, and a little bit deeper. And by the third time, this is just the third time you've spoken in your group, people will be saying things like, um, I pray every day. I worry about my children every day. Um, I nurse my toddler every day, you know, things that like you don't normally just say to some random, random stranger. Um, but we try to get people into a space where they can share those things that are more personal. Thank you. That was beautiful. I love that. And I will be um, uh, thanking you uh, for those icebreaker ideas as well. So I want to pivot back to food. Um, and this time it actually might be because I am getting a little hungry, but I want to take us back to food and, and ask you both because, you know, Salome, your model is so clearly food centric, right? And, and tea, coffee as well. We'll lump that in. So it's, food is it, 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 it is the subject line. Um, Chandra, food for you, and as you mentioned, really isn't. And yet, maybe even without realizing it, you all built it in as this critical component. So I'm wondering if you could both just speak to like, what is it about food? Um, what is it about food that seems to be transformative? I think regardless of who you are, how high, how low, where you've come from, food is our common denominator. You, you have something that you enjoy or you're curious about food or you have to fuel your body at some point. And so I think that curiosity about what does the other person eat? Hey, this is what I like, you know. I like mac and cheese. Oh my goodness, what is mac and cheese? 
And so now all of a sudden you're having this conversation about food that is occurring so naturally. There's questions about, so tell me what you had, you would have for breakfast in Kenya. And that is not offensive at all. And it, oh my goodness, I come out in my authentic self and I'll tell you about memories of my grandmother and what she would cook and what I loved about it. And you in turn tell me about your, and before you know it, um, we have crossed those divides that have been set up without even realizing that we've done that. And what I've noticed is at the end of that conversation or at the end of whatever food session you're having, the conversation always pivots to, okay, we need to do this again. When can we meet again and talk more about food? And it's like, yay, none of us is feeling offended. None of us is feeling hurt, none of us. And when we start there, then we're able to do some of those deeper dives as we feel safe, as we feel accepted, as we feel that sense of belonging. And even though it starts with food, it goes into other places that it's gone to places I would never have contemplated in the 17 years that I've lived here now. Chandra? Yeah, I think, you know, it's not just the, the food itself, although that is such an, uh, an intercultural experience and even just talking about it, like you said, uh, bridges those divides, but it's also the act of eating like everybody eats, we all have to eat. Um, and I think especially, you know, back when we used to do things like have a buffet set up, I don't know that we'll ever do that again. Um, but back when we used to do things like that and you're, you know, you're dipping your, your curry out of the same pot that someone else is dipping their curry out of. And you might be ideologically opposed, but you're eating the same food made by the same hands you know, from the same dish. And that's really um, just in and of itself is bridging that divide. And also, you know, as you're eating, you're having these conversations and it's really hard to be guarded when you're like, you know, shoving hummus into your face, right? So, so I think it's not only the food itself, but just the act of eating that reminds us we're all a part of this you know, this global family, this community, um, and we're not as different as we think we are. We all, we all eat. Thank you both for that. Um, Salome, I, I want to ask you a question, which is, um, how would you respond to somebody who hears about this, perhaps somebody in, you know, the immigration advocacy sphere, and he hears about your program and says, you know, well, that's great, but dinner isn't going enough. It isn't going far enough. Um, I'm curious, like, how have you seen these dinners and tea times? How have you seen them spur direct action? And, and what would your response be? I would actually let them know that, can you hear that? Or am I hearing my own things? Okay. Just wanted to make sure that we're sharing this experience together. <laughs> we are. We're, we're in it together. Uh, pandemic noises and all. It's, it's perfectly fine. Thank you. So I would actually tell them that the dinners are just the beginning. I remember when I came into this country, it was in November. And so soon it was Thanksgiving time. And people invited me. And people talked about Thanksgiving and talked about Thanksgiving. And I would be invited into, you know, each year I was invited into a different place. I grew up in a place where we didn't eat turkey. I mean, it's like, really? And then I tried turkey the first time and I thought, seriously, this is what everybody's waiting a whole year to eat, <laughs> right? And I said that and I thought, I'm sorry, I don't think, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then with time, when I said that in all honesty and I wasn't being mean or anything, then people started saying, actually, it's not the turkey, it's the cranberry sauce. It's the, and I thought, oh, so that's why you have cranberry sauce. And that's why you have the sweet potatoes and the marshmallows and whatever it is, right? And so it helped us get go deeper each year. And it wasn't just deeper with the food, because then, you know, somebody else will try like green bean casserole. I didn't like, I, I, I thought it was bland. I love it now. But that's where I started from, where I thought there's nothing to write home about here. 
And had I made it about the food, then I would have missed out on all these deep relationships that have developed. And my daughter in the process has garnered a grandmother. She calls her grandma Karen, but that's where it started from. Come for Thanksgiving. And we went and grandma Karen has shown her how to crochet and grandma Karen has shown her how to take care of chickens. And when they bring your, bring your grandma to school day, my daughter doesn't say my grandmother is in Kenya and therefore she cannot come. She has a grandmother that she's able to take. And then she's a task to explain, wait a minute, you're black, but your grandmother is. And we're like, you don't even, it doesn't matter anymore, right? But that's, so for me, food is just the beginning. It's, it's, it's the key that opens the door. And then we all walk in sometimes a little gingerly and other times kind of like kids eager to run in and figure out what's going on. But food is just that key that opens that door. And all of a sudden we're able to realize I've seen people who said, oh my goodness, I have the time I can help people read their letters. I have the time I can help somebody study for their immigration exam to become a citizen. And all of a sudden you begin seeing possibilities where before you couldn't see them because to you, this was an other and you could not see how your lives tessellate and come together. Thanks for that, Salome. Um, I think there's a lot of us who would agree with you on the turkey as well as the, the more poignant points as well. Um, Chandra, I wanna ask you a question. When I think about your work and the, 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 the grittiness of it, that folks are getting their hands dirty, they're building homes together, they're volunteering out in the community together, they are literally sweating. What is it that you think opens them up to relationship with each other? Is, is it that somehow they're getting out of their heads and into their bodies and this experience that really transforms into something spiritual? Like what, what is that? Tell us a little bit about, about that. Yeah. You know, at, at the beginning of this um, presentation, you had a quote from Gordon Alport and he was the founder of the um, social contact theory. Right. And he talks about how we don't actually have to talk about our differences to, to bridge our divides. We have to work together. And that's really, you know, kind of the basis of, of all that we do in the service projects. And I've seen people come into a room um, to do a service and conversation event and they're very kind of hesitant. They don't want to sit with people they don't know, you know, but once we assign people to a group to work together. And sometimes we gamify it a little bit, right? Like maybe we're packing kits for a homeless shelter, we're doing some kind of renovation project and you've got your little team that you're working with and you're supposed to you know, pack the, the women's kits or your group is supposed to add the, the socks or the Tylenol or whatever it is to the kit. Um, and people start getting into it, you know, and they're so focused on the, the thing they're trying to accomplish together that they forget that, you know, they are dressed differently. They come from different faith communities. You know, maybe they feel very differently uh, from each other about how some of these bigger issues should be addressed in the community. We work in West Virginia on the opioid crisis, right? And people have very different views about what the ultimate policy decisions should be about that issue. But if we're packing kits for the opioid recovery house, well then their goal is to get those socks and that Tylenol and the toothbrush into the bag, right? They, they want to make this happen to help those individual people. And so I think um, part of it, yes, is like getting out of your head about it and just you know working on something together. And I think part of it is also having that um, shared goal, even if it's just for that one day that you come to this service project, um, but working alongside each other and being able to accomplish something together creates that shared identity, even without having to talk about, you know, your differences at all. Well, thank you, Chandra. I, I'm, I'm being mindful of the time here and know that we don't have a ton of time left together. So I want to ask you 
Um, maybe just one more question, which is what of this work has given you hope? Um, I guess it's a two pronged question. And, and um, how can folks get involved? If other people are listening and they're like, oh my goodness, I, you know, I, I wanna jump in on this, um, how would they go about that? So what, what, what if this gives you hope and how can others be part of it? I think stepping out of your comfort zone, because that's what it is. When I'm with other Kenyans, when I'm with other people who come from where I am, I come from, I'm at home and I don't have to, but stepping out of that and saying, I want to get to know other people that are outside of my circle of comfort, that are outside of the people that I interact with every day. It could even be the people that I work with in the office every day, but I don't show up in my true self because I don't think we're going to jive. And yet I've realized when I have conversations as a mother, as a daughter, as a granddaughter, all of a sudden it begins to open up the other people that I thought didn't want to talk to me, that I thought we had nothing in common. And um, so like there's another lady that we have been doing the Zoom tea time thing together. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, I don't even know her. So it actually started with she invited me to her house and I thought, oh my goodness, um, I, I don't know. Are you sure? You know, it's the pandemic thing, right? And we went, took, took all the necessary precautions. And then I invited her to my house and we were able to discuss and say, hey, we have so much to talk about. Even if nobody else wants to talk about it, they can listen to us if that's all they want to do. And by the time we got the other ladies to come in and participate, we had already formed this bridge that was beautiful and we continued building on it and we have continued to build on it. And I think that that has also fed the energy for the other ladies who are joining us and they're realizing, wait a minute, it's not as difficult as it is. And, you know, she's um, a white woman who has lived in Indonesia. And I was like, are you kidding me? Tell me about Indonesia. And all of a sudden there was all this exchange of shared experiences and shared humanity. And that in itself is so very attractive and it attracts people in when they realize it, you know, so it takes away this thing of, oh my goodness, this is a black woman who has a funny accent and I'm not sure why, right where to place it. And I had to get over my own accent, right? Because I felt like every time I opened my mouth, the first thing people wanted to know is, oh, I, sent, I hear an accent. And I learned to say, um, yeah, and I hear an accent too. <laughs> All of us have an accent. And that right there breaks the ice. And rather than being hung up and strung up, we begin relating, realizing everybody has an accent. Everybody sounds different. And that is part of that uh, authentic self showing up and then taking it from there. Yeah, you know, Jordan, I think um, we don't know we need this kind of community until we really need it. And back in January, um, during the insurrection, we really, really needed this kind of community across divides. And one thing that gave me hope in that moment is actually um, a story from our Atlanta chapter. And when that incident happened on January 6th, the rabbi that we work with um, in Atlanta, his first instinct was to reach out to his counterpart, the pastor um, at Intown Community Church and, and to talk to him about, about what happened and to say, hey, what's your perspective? How did this happen? You know, I saw Christian symbols on the National Mall. What is that all about? Um, and then be able to put out a message to his own community about what happened. And so one thing that gives me hope is, you know, all of these little conversations, you know, what's your name mean? You know, where's your accent from? All of these kind of conversations over meals during these the service projects, it's all designed on purpose so that when we're in the crucible of our country wanting to, to tear apart, the center can hold, right? We can, we can reach out to one another in those difficult times and have a place of relationship to be building from. Um, 
And so it is the little stories of conversations that really do matter because that's laying the groundwork. So for, for One America, if you're interested in, in getting involved, um, we do public trainings every month um, online. You can go to our website and sign up. Um, if you're interested in bringing One America to work in your community, I'm happy to, to chat via email um, and you can reach out and, and we can start that kind of conversation. And I'll put my email address in the chat box. Judd, may I say one last thing? When everything has been going down, um, I remember my one thought was, will somebody please do something about this? Can somebody please tell us what we need to do? And whatever I was hearing wasn't resonating with the healing that I know needed to happen and the bridging that needed to happen. And then I realized, wait a minute, I am that person. And I know that I'm not alone. And if I can stand up and say, I am here and I'm available and will you join me? I'm really surprised by how many people have answered that call without even realizing that they're answering that call to heal our communities because the answers are all within us. So I think it's time we stop looking for them out there and thinking a politician or um, a religious leader or you know some organization will come. We actually have the answers. And when we realize that we're all hurting and we come together, that is where the healing, and when it, it is such a healing that happens naturally, then it becomes really difficult to tear us apart again because it's like, nah, -uh. I know my neighbor, I know my friend, I know my workmate, and I know that they have my back. And so we kind of like seal off those areas that people could come in and try and fragment us again. Thank you both. I um, uh, am so inspired by both of you every single time we talk. I um, just leave feeling so grateful for the work that you do, for your honesty and transparency and just willingness to share it uh, with the world. So thank you, thank you for that. I, uh, we've only got just a couple of minutes and I want to leave folks with a few resources. So hopefully you should be able to see a snippet uh, where you can learn more about their work. Some of you were asking questions about some of the details and a lot of those answers are actually in the cookbook. And so I'd invite you to, to take a look at the, um, the case study of the One America model, um, the example from Salome's um, programming as well as her recipe and would love uh, to um, invite you to be part of that, to maybe do one of the activities that's in this cookbook as part of Welcoming Week, to um, maybe you'll cook Salome's recipe and, and share it on social media and share it with her. And of course, as the speakers mentioned, to connect with them as well. I, uh, I want to thank you all for attending. I want to give a special thanks to Chandra and Salome um, for a just fantastic, fantastic discussion. So this session, as well as other sessions uh, that are being presented as part of the interactive, are all being recorded. And we will let you know when those are available so that you can listen to any other sessions that you might have missed. So be sure to share your learnings on social media using the hashtag interactive2021. Um, you can also leave us some feedback, <coughs> excuse me, in the SCED agenda. And if you're not a member of the Welcoming Network, we would love for you to become a member. So check out welcomingamerica.org. You can sign up for our newsletter, learn about membership levels and benefits, um, or you can contact us uh, at the email address you see on the screen. We will now take a 15 minute break and hope you'll join us at the virtual musical happy hour, which will start at 4.30 Eastern time. It's gonna be a fun hour of music, trivia, and a special announcement. Um, and if you aren't able to make that, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at day two of the Welcoming Interactive. So thank you to our speakers. Thanks to our participants. We are so appreciative and we will see you in a few minutes at the happy hour. Thanks all. Mm -hmm.